guys. Um, so I have a, a, a number of things that I wanted to say. For those of you who don't know about our summer workshops, there are uh, uh, pamphlety brochure things over there, and there's a, at least one of these cards, and I have another one if you'd like to look at, look at it, and um, all the information is available online. And Carla, who is over here, can answer questions for anybody who would like. Um, what else? Uh, as usual, uh, friend us on Facebook at Writer Speak Wednesday. And uh, next week we will have a, a kind of an, a local phenomenon, uh, Hilary Thayer Heyman, who wrote and self-published Anthropology of an American Girl, will be here next week um, to read and talk about her probably um, really culturally significant uh, accomplishment uh, uh, in terms of really creating a market for herself. I think that'll be really interesting for you guys. And um, now, without further ado, because we never ado our introductions, <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce the wonderful farmer poet, Scott Chasky. And I forgot to say, uh, there's a free poem from Scott for everybody over there at the book table oh, when he's done. Oh, so oh, join me in welcoming oh, man. This is um, uh, a translation of Lucretius, the Latin poet, by, uh, or shall we call him the Italian poet, by um, a teacher of mine, Basil Bunting. Darling of gods and men, beneath the gliding stars, you fill rich earth and buoyant sea with your presence. For every living thing achieves its life through you, rises and sees the sun. For you, the sky is clear, the tempests still. Deft earth scatters her gentle flowers, the level ocean laughs, the softened heavens glow with generous light for you. In the first days of spring, when the untrammeled, all-renewing south wind blows, the birds exult in you and herald your coming. Then the shy cattle leap and swim the brooks for love. Everywhere, through all seas, mountains, and waterfalls, love caresses all hearts and kindles all creatures to overmastering lust and ordained renewals. Therefore, since you alone control the sum of things, and nothing without you comes forth into the light, and nothing beautiful or glorious can be without you, Alma, Venus, trim my poetry with your grace and give peace to write and read and think. That's Lucretius. So now I'm going to read from um, an introduction to uh, this common ground. Uh, we spent ten years, uh, eight years, on the hill, on a hillside in a little seaside village in Cornwall. So that's the reference here to the Cornish soil, the southwest tip of England. It is part of a poet's job to enchant and to take upon himself the mystery of things, even if on occasion the object of inspiration comes in the shape of a hefty sack of compost. Above the cliffs of Mounts Bay, Edgar Wallace, who tealed the Cornish soil for over 70 years, taught me, above all, to sense in the natural music of a meadow what a seed or plant senses, to feel the interdependence of south wind, granite rock, mist, and a robin's chatter. One learns the trick of understanding the contract between land, sea, and inhabitant, as my teacher, the Northumbrian poet Basil Bunting, explained, by reading the wind, wave, and soil simultaneously with Yeats, Hopkins, Emily Dickinson, or Basho. My university mentor, Milton Kessler, 
spoke of the need for a writer to develop a believable speaking voice. What that was, I did not know, but now, after years of study in the field, and as a member of a farming community, I have some idea of what he meant. It is one thing to recognize the power inherent in nature and in words. It is quite another thing to communicate it. In my daily work, I encounter the essential beauty in a wet field of buckwheat, bell beans, and clover, a flock of crows descending once again to devour the tomatoes, the voice of a small wren nesting in the lemon balm. Because my field of observation is also home to a community farm, the whole experience is open to others. At the heart of every garden is the perennial cycle that I hesitate to name. It is so near to the heart of death and rebirth. Mythologies and cottage wisdom have always linked the span of a human life or incarnation with the mysteries of seasons in the soil. Lugging a Cornish cliff shovel down steep stone paths to the lower meadows, pacing the long rows of lettuce and root crops with a wheel hoe, heaving rye straw into newly planted garlic cloves, I have seldom paused to consider the obvious metaphor. Rather, my account of life lived on a particular farm is a response to the gesture of a sea breeze or the slap of a rough wind, a language more clearly voiced by catbird or red wing in the cedars or by the miniature English robin, territorial and eloquent, who would settle on the hilt of my cliff shovel, tiny talons to steel. In that instant, a word appears, as natural as butterfly weed or nettle, and I hear the Atlantic strike sand particle and rock, part of the ground we share, eventual soil. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit. I just wanted to start off by uh, reading, because um, that's what we're here for. We're, you're, you're here. I'm here to read. You're here to listen. And um, uh, I, I wanted you to hear the voice. Um, so that's uh, first a poem by a teacher of mine, Basil Bunting, and then, and then some prose that I wrote. I don't really make a great, I know what a poem is and I know what prose is, but I don't find that I need to distinguish between them in the same way that I used to. So what I'd like to do tonight, I've never done this before actually, I'm going to read a little bit of both, and um, uh, Susie has encouraged me to talk about, you know, the writing life and you know what that means to me and I've been doing it for a while now and and uh, I'm, I'm gonna you know make some comments here and there and then I guess we'll have quite a bit of time for some some questions at, at the end but the the uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start um, because the believable speaking voice that I mentioned um, if I've achieved it at all I don't know um, begins, you know, a while ago. And uh, so I'm going to go back to some poems. Uh, here's, um, here's a little book called Liana's Sirens that I, um, I wrote for my senior thesis at the, uh, another SUNY school, SUNY Binghamton. It was Harper College when I attended it. Um, but these are, so these are poems that I actually haven't read in, I don't know, 30 years or something like that. Uh, so this is 1972, and um, so this was the first little collection of poems that, uh, that I put together that I, I guess I felt comfortable enough uh, to release to the world. So this is called The Bull's Corner. Content to arena, swept and ton encourage pride. Limping on wheat, cracking the seed, set in a rut boundary. The mind is loosed in this, a ball weight holds us to the pole. Self contains limits that repeat, dry bone, wet bone. We escape the tether, building until familiar. Rising, the mind tames itself to the core. We begin to lumber, muscle flex and paw flat, the same ground to expand our sight. I'll read one more poem from, uh, from, from these very early ones here. Um, I remember being very surprised when this, um, I, I, it was my first reading. I, I think I was um, you know, 19 years old or something. And um, there was a, 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 
a number of the, the, the poetry students at the school were, were asked to participate with um, a couple of the professors who, of course, we uh, followed around and admired. And um, uh, so I read a couple of these poems. It's kind of amazing that I'm reading them now. And um, this is sort of the beginning of developing a voice. Uh, so this is called The Ease With Which We Know. Ear to the wall, we listen for light footsteps, stair to stairwell, of Chinese gentlemen or sages from a holy pyre. The footsteps are formulaic. We imagine ourselves in them. We retreat, reeling, not to be disappointed, not to discover origin, normality, or what rough beast if it does come. Most pure notions are unframed, bare papyrus on a wall, slight impressions we collect and pursue in our genius, quiet feet marking our clay. So the rough beast, of course, you know, I, I think the, the, the greatest influence on, on these poems uh, were the writers I was reading at that time and studying in school, and the rough beast, of course, is, is Yeats what rough beast will come, right? The uh, turning and turning, the Byzantium poem. Um, and, and Shakespeare, I think I was taking a guy, there was an amazing professor, uh, Zach Bowen, who taught Joyce and Shakespeare. And uh, so that language is what infused that, uh, that writing. Um, so along comes Basil Bunt. Anybody ever heard of him? Other than Susie, who uh, we talked together, and I, I always talk about Basil Bunting. Anybody else ever heard of Basil Bunting? Really one of the great poets of the, uh, of the 20th century. And um, not very well known. He's gotten more so in, uh, in, in England. He's from Northumbria, which is the, uh, the um, beautiful, um, uh, rocky, hilly land in between uh, England and Scotland, right on that border. And a beautiful accent, too. Anyhow, he, um, he came to uh, the States to teach at Berkeley originally in 1971 because and he was 71 years old because he needed money. And, and um, uh, uh, Milt Kessler, who, who's the other poet I'll, I'll read from, uh, who was teaching at Binghamton at the time, knew that Bunting was around and got him to come to Binghamton. Kind of amazing, really. So um, he's had a tremendous influence on, on my uh, poetry and you know, my view of the world, everything, since meeting him as a 19-year-old. As a I, I hardly ever spoke to him because I didn't quite have the courage, but I followed him around a lot. I used to walk behind him on the campus. And, um, so I'm going to read, uh, I found this as I was like looking through things to read for this, um, this evening. So here's something I found. Uh, this was a class that Basil Bunting taught, and it was called Rhetoric 158, Form and Theory, Readings for Writers. And uh, what we did the entire semester was um, set three different pieces that he gave to us in, in different kinds of metrics not the sort of thing that anyone is doing now. No one was actually doing it then, but Basil Bunting was there. So, so I, I, this is fascinating to me, and I'm just presenting this to you because this is still here. This is the sheet that I had in spring 1971, in Rhetoric 158. How this still exists, I have no idea. <laughs> I've lived in lots of places and traveled and moved, and we brought up three kids. And this sheet survived. Okay. So here it is. Sappho's best known, this is, this is Bunting. Sappho's best known song was translated into Latin by Catullus. It is the only translation which is better than the original. This is according to Bunting. So this is, this is his, the first stanzas. That fellow looks to me like a god, or something more than a god, if that's possible who can sit face to face with you, watching you and listening to your sweet laugh, while I, poor wretch, have all my senses snatched from me. For the moment I lay eyes on you, Lesbia, I've no voice left. 
My tongue lolls, a thin flame seeps through my limbs. My ears ring with their own buzzing, and both my eyes are gummed up in darkness. So that's his translation. And then, and then um, this, is his, this is Bunting's uh, rewriting of it, basically. Oh, it is godlike to sit self-possessed when her chin rises and she turns to smile. But my tongue thickens, my ears ring. What I see is hazy. I tremble. Walls sink in night, voices unmeaning as wind. She, only a clear note, dazzle of light, fills furlongs and hours, so that my limbs stir without will. Lame, I, a ghost, powerless, treading air, drowning, sucked back into dark, unless rafted on light or music, Drawn into her radiance, I dissolve when her chin rises and she turns to smile. Oh, it is godlike. That's Bunting. And then here's a poem of mine, influenced by this sort of thing. So I'm just following the thread. I just, who knows? I'm following the thread here, and this, this, is, this is influenced by this kind of language. So, you know, Bunting wrote um, odes. So naturally, um, I spent some years putting together something called a book of odes. Um, and this is from that. I, I, I took about three years writing it in my uh, late 20s, and, and it became my uh, thesis for my uh, uh, master's MFA, uh, which I went to England to do and, uh, and finish these poems there. Um, but it, these poems were sometimes written in Ithaca, New York, Maine, um, Oxford, England. It covers a lot of territory. The far bell passes with rust, blade, and stone, my idle land. Note, and made bed, thrush, and asylum, willow. Throatings from marsh wood. Against an apple blaze, fire on her lips in the pine room. Sound of the bog and stone, the axe left apple petals, her thighs wear in firelight. I kissed the underside before she left. So that's my ode after bunting. And um, here's another one. So I'm, I'm reading from the sort of, you know, following the, these early poems I read. This was sort of the next stage. Um, and, you know, bunting's word to us was that, um, you must read poetry aloud. So here I am, I'm doing it. I've been doing it for a lot of years. And uh, he, he has a wonderful phrasing about how the poem doesn't come to life. It's, it's dead on the page until the, the word is spoken and then it comes to life. And he had a wonderful way of reading as well. Um, so here's another ode. Another fascinating thing about this is that I had never at the time that I wrote this, I had never plowed any land, and um, nor had I anticipated that I would be a, a farmer for you know most of my adult life. Uh, but here it is. Here's the plow uh, in this uh, in this ode. Flax hung from cedar in the March bog. Frost on thread spins its own thread. Voice from the bow flush pearl that shone on a mirror field. Word, idle in asylum, sounds thick in the plow furrow. Breath clothes a net of hoarfrost. When wheat is green, my leaves rise, livened by branch and burr. Now out where ridge thaw whitens east, a thread circles for the bell point. So there are the odes. And uh, now we're going to move a little bit further here. And, uh, where are we? I think we're up to um, the influence of Milton Kessler, um, who uh, w was my teacher before at, at Binghamton before Bunting, and um, who, who remained just the, the closest of friends. Uh, our families were intertwined for uh, 30 years or so. And um, 
here, so I'm going to read a, a poem of Milt's. Um, the, um, just because the, his language had, um, his spoken language is an amazing teacher, he's the most wonderful teacher. Um, but his, so there wasn't much distinguishing the, the teachings that he gave um, when he was speaking poetry or the poems themselves when, when, when you're reading them. Um, so this is called Selected Random Sayings by Kosho Shimutsi, Chief Abbot of the Todaichi Temple in Japan. Uh, Milt visited and had an instant connection with this abbot. Flesh deepens spirit. Spirit stings flesh. Freedom, try walking. The dissatisfactions of a happy man, what's more difficult? Mud on your hands, sit, eat, don't fight it. Gold is gold, silver is silver, lead is lead. Cedars in a mountain, sweet fish in a brook. Saying anything perfectly, impossible. Straight searching is good, loitering on the way is fragrant. You have to forgive me. Once you realize it, it's simple. There are good days and there are fair days. A good, good, lucky one. A lucky, good, good one. See, even in me, there is something good. <coughs> to exist is very strange. Stepping down, be careful. Know yourself. We have been thinking this or that for 10,000 years. Today is best. He complains and enjoys the sound. That's Milt. A couple other little ones from Milt here because I, I want to add, add this part of the uh, American language that, that he really loved and that um, uh, came to influence my, my writing uh, when I was uh, too much, too much perhaps influenced by, um, you know, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dolphin, dapple dawn, drawn falcon, and his riding of the underneath him steady air. How he hung there high upon the rein of a wimpling wing, then off, off, forth on swing as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. I, mean, I love that stuff. That's Hopkins. But anyhow, there's this other way of going about it. And so here's Milt and these little, this, it's from these little snippets from a poem called Grand Concourse. Um, Mommy, when I first met her, had the softest, sweetest face you've ever seen in this world. You know what I mean. The dead call us. Come on, they say. Why waste your time on living? I see you're dressed up today, she said. No, these are my usual clothes, he said. I tucked my shirt in, that's all. It's the way I am. I just have a dressed up look. <laughs> a dressed up look, she said, leaving. See you later, he said. Smiling. <laughs> so, okay, there's Mel. Um, I'm trying to keep some sense of order here, but I'm covering like 40 years or something like that. So, so this one, uh, so I'm going to read now from the next stage as we were, we were living in, uh, on Love Lane in, in Cornwall. Megan and I lived for eight years. Um, Megan uh, wrote a letter to uh, one of the bird ladies, uh, Dorothy Iglesias, when Megan was 12 years old, and they carried on a correspondence for many years. And, um, boy, how to make it a short story. We wound up living in their houses, the bird ladies' houses in uh, Love Lane Studio and Love Lane Cottage uh, in Mouse, Mouse Hole, spelled Mouse Hole, it's pronounced Mousel, in Cornwall, the southwest tip 
right near Land's End in, in England, and uh, had our first, uh, were married there, had our uh, uh, first child, our first home, etc. So uh, very powerful in our in our lives. And, um, and I wrote this book called uh, Stars Are Sons, and it um, looks like this. There's the sun, there's the star. It has um, woodblock cuts by um, a fellow who lived in the village just up from Mausel, um, and uh, his name was Brian O'Casey, and he was the son of the Irish playwright, Sean O'Casey, amazing artist. Uh, and he did woodblock cuts for this book. So this is a you know a fine edition of which there are a number over there. Um, there were, we only made a hundred, but there's a few left. So this is called A Breath from Stars Are Sons. Meadow man, house scholar, from field to chair, I hear the deep choir of the anvil. Iron and rust, irony, dust. Then Nordic beat breaks to summer. Willows wave, elderberry beads gift the cloud. Dog rose shades the shore. In a measure of rage, I know the weightlessness of innocence. At dawn, silken nursery tents spin the field to song. Sea air, violet, betony stare, shake the man to make of breath a mortal joy. It's called a breath, and uh, I think I'll read one more from this uh, this little series. Um, so it's just a wonderful. I love this about you know the cooperation with with um, you know other artists. Is uh, we had this beautiful time for about a year where I, we had moved back here, and there were letters going back and forth, and some images and then another poem and everything and I, that process is just so beautiful. Um, so this is called Songs to My Son. And it's written in five parts. I won't really read the numbers. I'm just gonna pause a little bit before the parts. And um, the first one is uh, Descending, Songs to My Son. Then the surprise gift of death. The saw wets wings and the teacher's hands taken from his black robe. And the white zendo wood fire cracks, geese crow in the zero air. My back is straight, my wings are wet. I see stone Buddha and the bowl. I give to my son at midnight the song of a star's track. See. Orion in a virgin sky over the iron beads of the father tree, silver with sword to steer by, and the morning leaves fool's gold, the feather fall of memory. In the wood by the north-south road, morning traffic of wax wings over live wood and dead wood, cardinal drinks from the metal post, took, took, the pileated beak on pine, his red crest rises and shakes the ash. How can I drink the earthly portion of loss and laugh and sing and still release my wings? I stop to the sound of winter feeding in the trees. After rain, the bush blossoms with bees. Orion's day sword scores layers of needles and nuts on celestial ground. When the day cools, I return to the bee bush. They have left the flower husk to dive for the business of comb. All right, that's the next stage. Um, I think now we go here. So now I'm going to go to some poems written after we, um, well, no, here we go. We've got a couple that sort of span the time frame from England to returning to, returning to this country, and, um, and then up, up to the present. This is a, sort of a foundation one. This is um, because the, um, 
it, it, it speaks about what poetry is, um, the work of the eyes and of the heart, and this reference to I am infinitely in the open is, you know, the singer, the eternal singer Orpheus. And, um, and his statement, the statement of the eternal poet, is I am infinitely in the open. That's a good thing, but, you know, try getting through life being infinitely in the open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is called the Wren. My good luck, charm, the white, wailing, teeth, bared, bone, hyena, wears on his back the purple petal of May from the west country hedge as he stands in a drift of picked flowers and teak between seeds, songs, and hope abandoned. Like the wren in the perfect circle of her house under my house, I ask the companion's lightness and burden to nest inside, wings and music. Here, inseparable by conduct from poetry, the work of the eyes and of the heart, I am infinitely in the open. The black thorn hedge floods with spring wait, and in my room the things I am blinded by release to melody, sky. That's the wren. Here's another one that goes along with this, and this was written for uh, a Zen monk, uh, Hans Hokanson, who was a most wonderful uh, woodworker and, and monk. Uh, lived in the Northwest Woods. When we came out here, he had the um, he had the sticker on his car that said, "The Northwest Woods, the last stand." <laughs> and Hans was one of the first ones there. I think it's called the Wheel. My secret self, I build within, will not sing today. She is tired of the mask of the maker, and she or he would like to drift in the still of space. Listen. How will I know what I was not when I come to myself? As I ask you this, we possess a labyrinth. I say, I was that shadow. And these words harmonize under a canopy of sky created by audacity. That's a word that I attribute to Pasternak. I can't remember where it is, but somewhere in a Pasternak poem, he, he ends with that audacity, and uh, he certainly had it. Um, it's a wonderful word. Um, here's one. Um, this was written for um, my father-in-law, Bill King, who's a sculptor, and uh, uh, I read at his wedding, actually, to my mother-in-law, Connie Fox, who's a painter, Megan's mother. And it's called Myriad Things, and it really comes from a wonderful, wonderful phrase. Oh, oh I, I have it. I've got it. Um, by, um, by the 12th century Zen Buddhist philosopher Dogen, who said, to advance your own experience unto the world of phenomena is delusion. When the world of phenomena comes forth and experiences itself, it is enlightenment. That's not bad. 12th century, how about that? That's Dogen. So this, this, I read that because it half, you'll see at the end. It's called Myriad Things. Here there is a balance, an embrace of space just over the shoulder, or the vivid emptiness an open palm reaches to touch. But these animate figures still define space as mind trusting to the luck of a body can present to time the intimate, essential mystery of a thought. Looking up, these figures of paper, wood, bronze, beeswax, chiseled, cut, sewn, carved by a man, ask our imagination to laugh. Look, here, space is awake with the sculptor's words of oak and balsam, plastic, Tyvek, steel, aluminum-made fluid, the elegance of Paris, in burlap evening dress, a Cornish peasant of clay reading the waves of the sea, a copper Buddha under the Bodhi awake with things that come forth through him. Let them come. <laughs> so that's uh, 
and he does. He lets them go. A lot of he's an amazing guy. We just celebrated his 87th birthday. And he's out there every day in his studio. Um, so maybe, maybe one or two other little poems. Um, how, how are we doing with time? We're okay? I wanna, I'm going to finish. I'm going to read one or two poems. And then I'm going to finish with um, this little bit of prose. I'm working on another book now. And I thought, well... I just wrote this a week ago or something, so I should just finish with that. Um, this one is called uh, Cerulean. Out in the fields of Amagansett. As a breath above winter grains, the sharp-shinned hawk dives from a locust post to glide over rye and oats. Roots of umbellifera reach into cool clay. Against the dry hedge of wild berry vines and bittersweet, the cerulean flash of a bluebird. This landscape is simplified within earth's spin, not the lisp of leaves, but the bass note of bark. In boxed hives and hollows, apis mellifera survive on the nectar of aster and goldenrod, transformed and capped in waxen cells, food for the queen of inscape, part of the golden language of renewal. The sun's breath above winter grains lights the hawk's wings, and yes, the wings of workers within the hive. Rye survives the frosts, and sky takes on the color of a bluebird. So, we will go to that, that last bit of uh, that last bit of prose now here. You're going to have to ask me some questions because I haven't talked. I was supposed to talk more about the boy. I'm just reading, so you have some questions. You know, I just came back from, um, well, I didn't just come back, but in, 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 uh, in, at the turn of the year, I went away for a week uh, by myself to uh, uh, the island of Vinyl Haven. Uh, off the coast of Maine, and, and wrote for a long week. And I hadn't done that in, well, I don't remember. But I did that. It was because I've been working on this book called Seed Time for um, um, a couple of years. And I just, it's just hard to, I'm just the kind, I'm very slow at writing, and I, I, I need some time and space. And um, to find that collective time and space is not the easiest thing. So. Um, you know, I went to this island. And um, one thing I found there, which I, I think may be one of the most important things I'd like to pass on about the writing life, is that, you know, it's such hard work, quite honestly. So I've been, you know, uh, farming on steep cliff sides in Cornwall and, you know, uh, running a community farm out here for 22 years. There's 700 people that come to the farm two days a week and say, where's the cauliflower? And where's the lettuce? And where's the garlic? It's a wonderful community. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work. Writing is the hardest work I have ever done. All of that taken into account, all the carrying and hoeing and riding of tractors and all that, writing is the hardest work. However, when I was spent this week in Maine, some I turned over some new leaf or uh, some new needle of spruce might be the better way because I walked in these spruce woods, beautiful spruce woods, um, every afternoon, um, was that I found the joy in it. I was reunited with the joy in writing. And what is more important than that? So I'm going to read you some of that that I wrote on that island. Oh, what do I have to explain about this? So here I am, I'm, this is at the end of one little chapter of this book, and uh, I'm uh, in the uh, Tate Modern Museum uh, in London, and I don't know if anyone's been there, it's just an extraordinary thing, it's so beautiful. It's an old uh, power plant, uh, electricity plant, it's huge, it's vast, and, and um, the, the reason I, I, I we probably would have gone anyhow, but there was a, I'm writing this book on seeds, and there was an exhibition 
uh, by the Chinese artist Wei Wei um, of 100 million sunflower seeds. So they 100 million sunflower seeds made out of porcelain by hand and painted by people in this little village who used to provide uh, porcelain for the emperors of China. A really amazing thing to see this. So that's what I'm writing about when I'm talking about the sunflower seeds here. Um, okay. I paste it off. 100 million sunflower seeds spread 6 to 12 inches deep, occupies floor space roughly 200 feet long by 70 feet wide. Each porcelain seed was hand painted in Jing De Zhen with a thin brush, two strokes per seed as nature paints the seed husks of Helianthus. Wei Wei's statement is not subtle. Imagine the weight, the transport of millions of clay seeds to the Tate Modern. I'm reminded of another line by London's William Blake, eternity is in love with the productions of time. Looking down on a floor filled with seeds in the heart of London, I question what the writer Barry Lopez refers to as our distance both real and imagined from the natural world. The thread that connects us is delicate. Now I travel back in my mind to my encounters with Helianthus, to the sound of a seed plate revolving, to the husk that clings to the first germination, the stem that rises 12 feet out of silt loam, the brilliance of a sunflower face turning to the face of the sun. Weiwei's seeds, evocative of the power of a monolithic state, also speak of the promise of human hands, able to fire and paint a husk of clay or to place a seed into fertile soil. For seeds hold promise. Imagine the weight of stalks rising out of 100 million seeds of the pollen available to bees, of the rich oil held in the flesh of the seed kernel. There is a fabric of relationships available to us encoded in seeds, a timeless refrain which the poet Rumi hears as a greeting from the secret ones inside. Enfolded into this book after years of learning to read the field is my desire to practice listening. If you are as rooted as a Mongolian giant sunflower is, or as a bending alder in a meadow, or as a bristlecone pine in mountain gravel, Rumi reminds us the branches of your intelligence form new leaves in the wind of this listening. All right. <laughs> now we can have questions. Um, I'll start. Uh, and this is not the question that I thought I was going to ask, but I have to ask. Were you an outdoor child or an indoor child? Oh, outdoor. Yeah. What? One hundred percent. In fact, the you know, it's nice to um, you know think of what I do as you know building community and growing good food and all that sort of thing. But the key to it is being outside. That is really the key to it, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Mostly was involved with sports. <laughs> Most poets are. <laughs> yeah. 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 Scott, um, I know you know the Seamus Heaney poem, uh, Digging. Uh, the grandfather digs with a spade. Right. And he digs with his pen. Right. You literally dig with both. How does one inform the other? Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, you know, I have, I, I, I'm kind of um, happy that I don't have an easy answer for that. Because mm -hmm. I've been asked that quite a bit, especially after, you know, that, that book, This Common Ground, really has to do with that. And, um, and I actually tried to follow it up a little bit further with this book about seeds. I really was trying to weave in I don't know, reflections on the, on the writing life and what it was like to write and different writers and everything. And, and it's interesting that editors wouldn't buy that. that <laughs> so now I'm back to talking about seeds and I'll weave in a few things here and there. Um, I, ultimately, I think it really has to do with um, the rose, you know, and, and, you know, there's a line of poetry that you're creating and there's a line of seeds that that you're sowing, etc., and you know whatever 
it is that's involved with that 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 informs it about as much as the other aspect is that you know um, even on a community farm with all these people there's always the back field where you can go hide out <laughs> escape from everybody and then you can think you know you can muse a little bit and you can actually muse a little bit on the tractor so they fit kind of they fit quite nicely together and also um, maybe it has something to do with renewal because uh, spring uh, is everlasting renewal, as Basil Bunting said. And uh, when you're farming, the energy that you derive out of that is unbelievable. And, and, and that's the kind of renewal that, as a writer, you have to keep finding. In whatever way, you have to keep finding that. Yeah, yeah the thing about um, maintaining, I, I think it's... It, it's not the easiest thing to do to actually, you know, most writers find other ways that um, support their writing more directly, and, and, and this isn't quite that. So um, to maintain the, the uh, and to honor the, um, what the writing life means, you know, year after year, and, you know, when sometimes no one's listening or no one's buying the book or, you know, whatever it is, then um, that's a challenge. Luckily, I've been able to do that. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you speak more to <coughs> where you were before this? You say you made a, a decision, or it was not on your path to fall into farming. And you say maybe about how you knew that that was how you wanted to spend your life. Yeah, I, the, 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 the really important piece of that really has to do with what you don't know. It really has to do with, you know, whatever, uh, you know, a, the, the arc of a life is, you know, the sort of des destiny, whatever the arc of a life is. And I mean, when Megan wrote to a bird lady in Cornwall, there was no idea, this is Megan, by the way. When Megan wrote to a bird lady in Cornwall, there was no thought at all that, you know, we would, she would be living there years later, be married there and have a child and all that sort of thing. Um, so it does it has something to do with, you know, um, following that arc, recognizing when, where that arc is. So when, when we got there, well, before we got to Cornwall, um, I actually, my, my uh, entrance into England really led through Ireland. So I saw a poster, Megan saw a poster as well, as we met in England. Um, and, and the poster was, you know, advertising this Antioch program for writing, Center for British Studies in London, but the, the program started in Ireland uh, in the summer, and my mother is Irish, and, and boy, I'm connected to that country. So I went there and then wound up in England, and to uh, support myself, I got a job as a gardener. Unpredictable, I, who knows, you know, and the English love and know their gardens. So I learned right there, and that led to, when we went back to Cornwall, um, again, uh, you know, little tiny fishing village, these cliff meadows, um, looking out over what's called Mounts Bay, it's really steep going down uh, to the water with a hundred foot drop off, a really magical, enchanting land and uh, I was told right when we arrived there that this was called the earliest ground in Britain and that just I remember that boy there was a ring there the earliest ground in Britain. the first potatoes the first flowers came out of those meadows that got to Covent Garden in London and that meant a lot to me and so I said I'm gonna learn how to grow things in those meadows and then uh, when we got back here um, I made a choice. I, 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 there it was one point where I was uh, offered, I had actually accepted a job to teach in the Antioch program, and um, I, I decided not to do it and wound up gardening. And, and when we got back here, this um, community supported agriculture movement was taking off. And, and one of the reasons I, I became an expatriate was because I was too frustrated with, I couldn't find a place, couldn't find a place here. There was no place for me. And so I went somewhere else and I learned other things. And when I came back, um, I found something that um, I could be engaged in on, on so many levels that had to do with um, 
uh, you know, the writing life and, and uh, building community and working for social change. And I found all of that in this community supported agriculture thing, which didn't exist until then. So there's the arc, you sort of follow the arc, right? And you get lucky and um, I had some luck. Thank you, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, it's interesting to me that your your poetry is not very political, but your life is mm -hmm. sort of political. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has a political stance. Like, yeah. Is that conscious, or is that just what subject matter? I've tried. I I don't seem to be able to do it. I've tried actually to write some sort of, you know, protest poems, and, mm -hmm. or you know, anger at you know the the next atrocity or I've tried that actually and and I read newspapers <laughs> and, um, and I'm aware of it all but uh, so I've actually found I can't do it I don't know I, it doesn't sound right to me and so and I'm not really a nature poet if you ask me I'm I, I'd say I it's not what I am at all um, but um, I found another way you know linking into this sort of idea about living a life where you can, you know, take part in the social change that you hope to, hope to, you know, to encourage. Uh, you know, I've served on um, a number of boards now. I've been a founding board member a couple times, an organization of Vermont called the Center for Whole Communities. Uh, now I'm a founding board member on Sylvester Manor Educational Farm in Shelter Island. Now I was the president of NOFA New York for five or six years or something like that. I've been on that board for like 10 years. And, and I can influence the things that, I can do that. I can't, if I'm writing protest poems, they're not going anywhere for me. But I can influence the kind of change that I can see it. I can see, the, I can see how to do it and I can see a possible result. And and um, that means everything. To me, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. Is your writing life regimented in any way? For instance, do you have a specific place you write or a specific? Context? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so when I lived in England, uh, when we had this studio, and I had a, a I built a a table desk and looked out over the water. I'd go there and I'd write every morning. And you know, but this was before children, and, you know, need to, you know, pay for school and more mouths and all that sort of thing. So, um, so then it's just wherever I can do it until, and I actually finished the, the, um, the first book I, 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 I found a rich. So I, the, the, the quicker answer is just, I'm able to find a regimen. I mean, I, I, I said for a year, I have to have a week to finish this sort of proposal and first bit of this book, and it took me a while to get there, but I did it. I, I had a week and it went to the place in May. Uh, but the first one, I, I wrote for an hour at the end of the day, at the farm day, after everyone left. And, it, and I was just there in my, um, uh, in my office, and I said, okay, I have an hour before I go home, and I, I'd write for an hour. So yeah, I mean, it's really important. You just have to make some sort of routine. And, and it's, I think the important thing is that it's going to change. It's not always going to be the same routine. Well, maybe some people. I mean, I know that, who, who is it? Was it Ruth Rendell who has written like more books than anybody has ever done? And she writes for five hours every morning if she's still alive. You know? I heard her some story about this a while ago. You know, she sits down and writes for five, five hours every single morning for her entire life. Yeah. So are your children writers or farmers? Oh, they're great, our kids. Um, <laughs> they are, boy, they're, they're sort of taking off in their own ways. No one's going to farm, I don't <laughs> But I didn't get to it till later, so you never know. But our older son is back here, uh, and he's, work, he's involved with uh, filming and editing at, at, at the Ross School. And our daughter is uh, studying arts and communication and started with photography, and she's in London. And our younger son... Um, had uh, just did his senior project, which was an amazing uh, collection of paintings. He painted um, surfing as his other love, so he painted about the ocean, about surfing. So, and in his what? 
add that he wrote poems. He wrote poems. poems. Of course, he wrote questions. poems. <laughs> Anyhow, he put the whole thing together. It was really beautiful. And uh, you know, well, they kind. Of, who knows what they really? Well, they they've been very nice to us. They've been saying some nice things to us recently. But they grew up in a, you know, with two poets as you know parents and and their um, grandparents that live here, a sculptor and an artist. And, it's kind of they're kind of they're kind of used to it, <laughs> and they're amazing kids. Three of them. Scott, yeah. Josh died fifteen years ago. Any writing from I did. I wrote. I I wrote. Um, uh, I worked for probably uh, uh, three months or something on a little piece to communicate what that. It was not. It's hard to define. I, I just was communicating the the what that meant, what that event meant to a community, and 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 the 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 you know uh, the what what the community gave back to me and to the place and everything was just phenomenal. And I felt it was really my place to to try and. Just, just try and write some words about what that could possibly mean. I, you know, it's impossible to really, to really say. But, you know, in that, I, there is that piece where I wrote about the, the heart of the garden of, you know, of death and rebirth, and um, so I tried to write about that. Yeah, and it's always, always going to be there. So whatever I write from now on, there will be a kernel of that, uh, that in there. You're welcome. Really, that was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Scott will be signing copies of his book about the farm, his common ground, and he also has a couple of sets of copies of the beautiful Yeah, and for those, right, and for those people who, um, don't have spare money in their back pocket, there's a free poem. And that's true. <laughs> and he will sign the free poem without charge. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. That was great.